Welcome to another episode of Dirt Cheap Daily. This is the first episode in a series of Dirt Cheap Dailies where I give my legacy a major facelift. Be sure to subscribe to see the end result. Alright, so I just wanted to give a couple of tips if you're going to be sanding down your own car. Now, there are some perks to sanding down your own car. After you sand it down, you can take it to Mako and they will spray it for you for around $200, which is a pretty good deal. The tough part of a paint job is the prep. So as long as it's prepped right, it doesn't matter too much who sprays it. Now, Mako won't give you a show car finish, but you'll have a new color if that's what you're going for. Anyway, so here's some tips if you're going to be sanding down your own car. All right, so the other day I came out and I sanded down the whole car with a palm sander. This isn't an orbital sander, it's just a normal palm sander, which makes it a lot cheaper. And you can do the orbital part on your own. Now this only goes side to side, but if you spin it yourself, that kind of does the orbital part. So I also picked up a big box of 320 grit wet dry sandpaper from Amazon. I think I paid about 15 to 20 dollars for a 25 pack and this should last me um, beyond this car so it's a good deal when you buy bulk you get a better deal usually so that's what I always try to do because I know in the future I'm gonna be sanding 320 grit is a really handy sandpaper to have around so I stuck some 320 on my orbital and I went over the whole car um, kind of you can see here I strayed away from the very edges because this has a lot of power, it also has um, some abrupt edges, and so if I was sanding in here, there would be a pretty good chance that I would um, do more damage than I want to, to the, the rubber and plastic trim. So I stayed away from it, and did just the main body of the car, the main roof, all of the bigger surfaces have been done, all right? So, I finished all that up the other day, and so today, I started, this is a foam sanding block. I found they work really well on cars. They can conform to the contours of your car. So all along this legacy, there's a divot. There's a divot that goes along the whole thing. If you push in on it, it'll conform to that curvature of the car. So I found these work really well. They don't last for very long. Um, and again, this is a 320 grit one. I got it for about $2 on Amazon, which is the cheapest place you can get them, but they don't last long at all. Um, so I saved it to do these edges right along the rubber because this side here and this side here are not sanding edges. You can put it straight up against it and push into it and sand without doing any real damage to the plastic or the rubber. So that's why I really like these sanding blocks. But because I know that these sanding blocks, these sanding sponges go out really fast, they don't last a long time, I picked up a pack of this ultra flexible sanding paper. It's the same stuff I used on my rims and I was really happy with it then so I picked up a pack to try it out now and I'm super happy with it. It says it lasts 15 times longer than normal sandpaper and I think it really does. It's really good stuff. So what I do, I just wrap this around my sanding block like that. And I use the sanding block just like I normally would. So this will still contour because it's, it's rubber. Um, so it will still contour to, it'll still flex to the contours of the car with the sponge. It works really well. I would highly recommend getting a sponge and the ultra flexible 3M sandpaper. Anyway, so then I just go over all the spots that I missed with the palm sander. So I'm just going back over all of the, the smaller areas around the windows, the door trim, the door handle, things like that I'm going to do by hand because I don't want to scuff them up and I don't want the, them to be damaged by the, uh, the palm sander. And so this spot right here, you can still see kind of a chip. So you have the clear coat, you have the color coat, and you can almost see that you can see the layers here. So you have the clear coat up here. I sanded through the color coat, 
into the primer and then there's a base primer it's actually the sealer and it's kind of greenish and then right in the middle there you can see that I got down to the metal and then there's a chip here which is down to the metal so what I did was just sand 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 all the way around to drop down through the clear coat the color coat the primer and the sealer all the way to the base metal so I'm trying to get rid of the hard edges of that chip so I'm gonna keep sanding And there we go. So I'm all the way down to the bare metal here. The chip has actually started to rust and that's why it's off color. But it is smooth, you can feel it with your finger. And it's smooth, so I'm gonna go ahead and paint over that. But that's what you wanna do with that kind of a situation. Now down here, <clears throat> right here you can see a kind of a chunked out line. And that is from my palm sander. So you want to be really careful. What I did with the palm sander, I came in at an angle and it chunk, chunk, chunked the paint all the way down through the primer and sealer all the way to the bare metal. So you want to be really careful when you're using your, your palm sander so that that doesn't happen. If it does happen, it's not the end of the world. You just sand all the way through just like I did on the other one. You sand through it all the way down to the metal and you'll be all right. So something like this, most of the cars that I pick up have some rust on them and I'm not really too worried about it. I have some Rust X, which is a chemical that turns the rust back into metal um, and kills the rust, stops it from oxidizing. I'm going to go ahead and treat this with that before I spray. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that too much because really this is my Dirt Jeep Daily. And having one small hole in the back of the fender is not an issue for me. Especially in the future I might be putting on fender flares and I would probably cut this section out to do that. So I'm not worried about it at all. We're going to just sand this down a bit more, um, peel back this these chipped paint, peel back the chipped paint because everything, there's water underneath there and there's rust underneath the paint so you want to get the paint back as far as you can, as far as it'll chip on its own. You can use a paint scraper or even a screwdriver if you're careful to do that. And just peel it back around out here to where there's no more rust underneath. And then you can sand it down, use a rust protective, and then I would also use a paint like Rust-Oleum, which is a rust inhibitor with a primer on that so it doesn't rust in the future. Alright, prep work for plastic is a, almost identical to your prep work on your paint. You never want to use too harsh of a sandpaper on your plastic because it is softer and so I I try to not go to a lower grit than 320 on plastic like on bumpers and such uh, because really they usually don't need it. You can see some chips and and scuffs and stuff in the bumper but it is a bumper so I'm not gonna worry about it too much. If the bumper gets hit again or if I back into something on accident or if someone nudges into me while they're parallel parking, I don't want to have to worry about it. I'm going to paint it and prep it correctly, but I'm not going to go and fill all these little scratches because it's a bumper. That's what it's made to do. It's to buffer the, the car from another car or another object. And so I'm not going to worry about it being perfect. I don't want to spend a ton of time filling all these holes and scratches just so that in the future it gets bumped and I I spent so much time for nothing. It's a bumper, we're gonna leave it as a bumper. Just color it. So, that's kind of it. It takes a really long time, but the biggest thing, I'll show you when I, when I uh, wash it off, but the biggest thing you're looking for is just to make it, you can see here, obviously this is still glossy, right down here, I haven't done the drip rail yet. And this whole area here is flat finish. That's what you're looking for when you're prepping your car. You can see here it's glossy and flat. You want the whole car to be flat before you spray or before you take it to someone to spray it because that's what's gonna make sure you get good adhesion with your new paint. 
So get your whole car, non-glossy. I've driven this around for a couple of days like this to get funny looks, but really it doesn't matter because I'm gonna get some even funnier looks when I'm done with my paint job. As I've said in previous episodes, proper prep is essential for a good paint job. In the week leading up to actually getting paint on the car, I spent hours and hours prepping the car. As the paint job was in pretty good condition without major scratches or peeling top coat, I sanded the whole car with 320 grit and called it good. I was planning on painting with Rust-Oleum enamel, which is really thick paint that I've had success with in the past. Because of its thickness, it's capable of filling all the scratches of a 320 grit sandpaper. If your car's clear coat is peeling, I'd recommend using 220 grit to sand away all the top coat and then going over it again with 320 or 400 grit. A higher grit will give you a smoother surface and therefore a cleaner paint job, but as I'll be spray painting the car, I already expect there to be a few imperfections and spending my time sanding with a higher grit than 320 won't have much of an effect on the end result and it would be a waste of time and money in this case. Be sure you're using a dust mask while you prep, you don't want to be breathing in all those tiny paint chips. I can't tell you the number of times I've got sinus infections or bad head colds from not using proper protection, even on small paint jobs. At the minimum use a dust mask, but I'd recommend a respirator like the one I'm using. I picked mine up for $12 and I've had it for about 6 years. It's totally worth it. When your prepping's all done, Wash the car and check for any spots that are still glossy. If it's completely flat, you're ready to mask everything off. With everything masked, prep your spray cans and get to work. White paint oversprays everywhere, so make sure you lay down a lot of plastic or cardboard and mask off farther than you would normally when spraying white. Also, be sure to spray far away from things you don't want covered in white dust. You can see the plumes of paint coming off as I spray, so be sure to wear your nose mouth protection. You don't want to be breathing in paint. Even if it's a quick spray job, put on at least a dust mask. Spray painting your car is easiest if you have another person helping. Even if their job is to just shake the next can of paint while you're painting, it helps. Another perk of having someone help is their ability to see what you can. After spraying and spraying, you'll get tired, and sometimes you can't see areas that need more paint. So if you can, have another person around to ensure even coverage. My first coat doesn't cover the whole surface. You want to just get enough paint down to act as a base. In my first coat, you can see stripes and areas where red is showing through. This is on purpose. If you try and get full coverage on the first coat, you're exponentially increasing your risk of getting a run. And believe me, the last thing you want to do after spending four days sanding down the car is to have to wait for it to cure, sand it down again, clean and prep the surface, which usually consists of remasking a large portion, and then finally respraying it. It sucks, so don't do it. Your first coat should just be a dusting. With such a light coat, the paint will flash really fast and it will act as a bunch of little supports for the heavier coats you'll put on next. Check out my rim painting series for more tips about spray painting. Once the car has a light coat of paint on, you're now ready to go ahead and do a full color coat. As you spray, you want to be very consistent and overlap on each pass. Make sure you have enough light so you can see how the paint is laying down and bonding with the last pass. To have a consistent sheen, you want to create a line of wet paint that moves across the panel as you spray. The tail end will start to flash, but as long as you keep the wet line consistent, you'll end up with a great sheen. This can be really difficult when you're working with a full gloss paint like this Rust-Oleum Blue I'm using. As you color different panels, it's extremely difficult to keep consistent wet line across the whole car. You'll want to plan your route before you spray. 
If you're able, the best way to get a consistent wet line is to work your way from one corner of the car, let's say the driver's side front, working your way around to the rear and around back to the front passenger side, all in one coat. This is extremely difficult with spray paint as the spray stream is actually really small. It was really hard for me to get a consistent wet line since I was painting in direct sunlight on a really hot day. This made the paint flash extremely fast and I wasn't able to keep the whole area wet at the same time. The best time I found to spray paint large areas is on an overcast day that's in about the 70s. Any hotter than that or in direct sunlight, it's going to be really hard to keep a consistent sheen. I knew I wasn't going to get those conditions probably for the rest of the summer here in Utah, so I decided to do my best and deal with the outcome. So once the car had the colors on it that I wanted, I started masking out and coming up with ideas for the design I wanted. This was the really creative part of the paint job that I'd been looking forward to. I started out just laying down some tape to see what I would like and to give me a better idea of how I wanted to proceed. After a lot of standing around and looking at it, I finally just went for it. This green tape I'm using is frog tape. It's a much higher quality than the normal blue painter's tape, and it doesn't leave any residue. The biggest reason I chose to use it is because of its ability to create perfect lines where the paint doesn't bleed through the mask line. I've used this product in the past, and it's completely outperformed normal masking tape. It's more than twice the price of normal tape, but it's worth it. Be sure to plan ahead and buy it on Amazon. It's the cheapest place I've found, at almost $2 less than in Walmart. After you have your design masked out, go back over the whole thing, pressing down the edges of the tape before you spray. Another one of the downfalls of it being so hot was that the frog tape kept curling up and I didn't get as many perfect edges as I'd hoped. This was just another one of those things that couldn't be helped and I dealt with it. After spending so much time masking and spraying, I was pretty impatient to unmask everything and see what it looked like. You don't want to wait too long, otherwise the masking tape can leave residue and it can be hard to peel off. I've even seen paint crack from peeling masking tape off after the paint had fully cured a week later. So be sure to get the tape off before the paint fully cures. As you're peeling the tape off, do your best not to let the masking tape touch the car again. You can ruin your sheen, and if the paint is slightly wet on the back side of the tape, you can get paint on the colors you don't want. Now the sad part about this is I'm peeling off like five bucks worth of tape. <laughs> but 
but I think it's worth it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to show your support. Check out my Instagram for daily updates and stay tuned for tomorrow's episode.